All right, we are doing an intro video for Tract 14 at the tracks at White River. Beautiful property. It's about 10 acres in size. In um, a, it's about square in shape. It's about it, at the shape of a square. It's about 660 by about 660 feet. Uh, we've got it shaded with uh, orange toward the middle here. So there are, are about 36 tracts at the tracks at White River. So a very small uh, rural development and uh, track 14, uh, like we said, is, is kind of kind of in the middle, uh, but still has uh, some some really nice privacy features that we'll see in a, a few moments here. Uh, we shaded it so that just so it'd be easy to see uh, while we were zoomed out, but we'll zoom in, in in just a minute as well. But zooming out, you can see the obviously the White River. Uh, extremely close to the properties and um, if you look to the lower right that's going to be Batesville Arkansas which is the county seat for um, and I'm drawing a blank on the county right now I can't believe that it's not Crawford County shoot it'll come to me later and I'll yell it out while we're talking about roads or something <laughs> uh, so um, Batesville about uh, 15 minutes southeast of the tracts and without going through the, the entire route because you'll see that in the listing page, uh, not only in the listing page for the particular property, tract 14, but also in the listing page that shows general information about these tracts. I think we lay out the directions pretty well. So um, you definitely want your four wheel drive truck or SUV. Uh, not just so you have the, the traction if you need it, but so you'll have that little bit of extra clearance if you need it, if you hit a bad spot or, or whatnot. Uh, having a couple extra inches of clearance that you would have in a four-wheel drive can tend to make all the difference. Uh, so why don't we zoom in here. Okay, so to get to track 14, uh, either way you're going to come in on Lock 3 Road. That's this green line here. That's the county road. It's a county road, but the last house out here is just before you get uh, to the tracks. And the county really only maintains up to that last house. Uh, there has not been a home uh, or really a cabin past that um, for many a year, I would say. And so the county just hasn't done very much at all on that section of road. Uh, so I, for, for a hunter, for a recreational user, that's often a good thing because it keeps... Uh, other people from you know running up and down the roads or whatnot it's just a, a section of uh, ground that's largely ignored by everybody um, other than the, the people who own land out here for hunting which certainly uh, use it um, by the way that the area for hunting is fantastic um, when we started this project the guys put out a couple of game cameras and we got hundreds and hundreds of pictures of um, beautiful deer and, and turkey um, just, yeah, <laughs> really, really great wildlife population out here. Uh, the river itself, so you'll come in on Lock 3 Road, and you'll come to a point where you go actually um, under a power line. And so if you're kind of paying attention, you'll you'll know right when you get there, because to the left and right, the, it'll be a, a cleared strip, and that's the power line. And what that is is actually the power line that um, takes the power from the hydroelectric uh, dam and brings it to Batesville, or that's what we've been told. Um, but it's a really good landmark because as soon as you get past that, there'll be a Y in the road, and if you go right within a few hundred feet, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be at the White River, and if you go left, you'll be going up toward the track. So if you go right toward the right, the White River, white, right toward the White. Um, this straight line you see is not a road, that's a set of train tracks. Uh, there's a, a few miles to the north, some type of sand mining operation that, that mines a special type of sand, and we've been told that that's the only train that uses those tracks, and it's, it's not very often. So we keep hoping there'll, there'll be a train when we're out there. There never has been. Uh, but either way, there is still um, good river access because there's actually a tunnel, a short tunnel that goes right under the tracks. And if we switch to a different view, like a Google view, we should be able to see the actual concrete ramp that goes into the river. 
There we go. Yeah, you can see that. So the the road itself goes directly under the tracks. There's a, a nice concrete uh, tunnel that has been there quite some time, but it was well built. And then you've got the concrete, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a boat launch or whatnot, but it goes right down um, basically to the water. And the whole reason for its existence, because it is very unusual to have access uh, under a set of train tracks, is that uh, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, this was actually a, a ferry crossing. So people still, you know, they had to get across the river. Uh, there were very few bridges that, that could span that kind of distance uh, safely, um, and, and probably none in rural areas because that would be an expensive bridge. But uh, to go back and forth, people would take the ferry. And so there was some type of setup on the west side, and then on the east side was basically uh, the setup you see now. It, it wouldn't have been this poured concrete ramp. It would have originally been wood, I'm sure, but um, the ferry would come and go. And then when the tracks were built, in, uh, in whenever they were built, the late 1800s or early, early 1900s, the railroad would have basically had no choice but to install that expensive tunnel there because they couldn't cut off uh, uh, a, uh, a ferry that was so commercially uh, popular uh, without probably making a lot of people unhappy and bad press for the railroads, I'm sure. Uh, so very, very few times will you see that, but that was the case here because that was an established ferry crossing called uh, Walls Ferry. And in fact, there was uh, at one time um, about when the tracks came through, I believe the train tracks came through, there was a, a tiny town there uh, called Walls Ferry and there was a post office and there was, uh, you know, not much else, but there was the ferry crossing. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a neat bit of history, but that's why that access under the tracks to the river is there. So very, very few access points to the White River, especially the east side of the White River with those tracks, uh, because just the way they, they built those tracks doesn't really lend itself to a uh, a crossing that goes over the tracks. Um, there, I'm sure there are some, but more often than not, they just didn't do a crossing. They just laid the tracks through and, and that was that. So this, this one having a tunnel is pretty darn cool. Okay, so that's if you go right after you pass uh, under the, the big power line. If you do not go right and you kind of stay the course on Lock 3 Road, it's going to take a left and it's going to go up a long hill. It's not super steep, but it is a fairly long hill. And that's another reason why that it's good to have four-wheel drive. Uh, say it's been heavily raining and you get halfway up and slip a little bit. Um, if you're in a two-wheel drive uh, truck, uh, I mean, you're backing down the hill no matter where you are. But in a four-wheel drive, you, you know, you can just lock it in and, and keep on going. Uh, when you get up to the top of the hill, it levels out. The road curves a little bit. And if you look to your left, you'll see a gate set back about 20 feet or so from the road. And that gate is going to be the, the uh, start of the main easement road out here. Uh, so when you're heading out there, just let us know. We'll, we'll let you know if the gate, uh, I'm not sure if, if the guys have been locking it or not. Um, but if they have been locking it, we'll, we'll let you know how to get in. And um, super easy. And uh, you can go and... and um, view a track that you're looking at or a track you purchased or, or whatnot, but uh, just give us a shout and we can help you out with that. So the, the easement road goes in, kind of meanders easterly, and we got to turn these labels back on so we can see what's going on here. Okay, there we go. Uh, the first track you'll come to is track 9, and then quickly track 10, and then you'll be on track 13. And then if you take, or basically stay to the right, then you cross over onto track 14. And 14 is, is a cool track, and we're gonna turn off that orange shading because that served its purpose. Let's see if we can find that and shut it down here. Do, 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 come on. Oh, that was easy for once. Okay. Uh, so before we start looking at the topography, let's look at the actual tree cover uh, the Google map, usually the Google maps are summertime maps. In this case, it's a winter map, but we like that because on a property like this, you can glance at this wintertime Google map and know that there hasn't been, um, you know, any recent commercial logging on the property. 
So had this had any any kind of real logging, um, then for, for quite a few years thereafter, you, you would see that with a, a wintertime aerial photo. You would see uh, limbs and tops scattered around. You would see small brush piles, medium, large brush piles. Um, and you would likely see actual stumps because they do uh, tend to jump right out at you in a wintertime aerial photo for the first several years after property's been logged. Uh, so the fact that we're seeing none of that, uh, that's a, a great thing to, to see on this property. Uh, so glad to see in this case that that's a wintertime aerial. Actually, you can zoom in pretty well on that. Looks like it's going to be mostly hardwood trees. Uh, easy to tell in the winter because uh, the trees that don't have their leaves are likely deciduous trees, likely red oak or white oak. Uh, although we've seen chestnut out here, we've seen hickory out here, um, we've seen a lot of different trees. And you're likely to have at least some cedar or pine or, or both. You, you're going to have some softwood trees too uh, on your property. I mean, with, with 10 acres of heavily wooded property like this, you're talking about tens of thousands of trees of, of all different sizes. Um, yeah, that's, that's nice to see. Let's look at a summertime aerial here. So we'll go from Google to, I guess that's hex aerial that's called. I would say this one's helpful in telling us that it definitely is a, a mixture of timber. If you look at all the different shades of of uh, green and in some cases uh, brown, so it might be a, a late, late summer aerial. Um, that's kind of tipping us off that they're, um, this isn't some tree plantation, tree farm, with just one type of tree that got planted. This is um, real Ozark smother nature with a great mixture of timber. Many, many different species. Okay, let's go to a topo map. And we'll see how the how the ground actually lays on this property. Okay, we have two topo maps. They're very similar. This is uh, called vintage topo. It's a, a little older, and then we've got modern topo right there. And they're they're saying the same story. I mean, they they usually tell you the same thing. We tend to use vintage photo because it it has a little more information that modern topo doesn't bother to include. Uh, on the vintage topo there, this dashed line is just indicating um, that when this topo map was created, which is probably around the 1950s, uh, that there, there was some kind of road or trail there. Um, and that's the road or trail that, that's still there. And, and we have, uh, had known that these were in existence for many decades, so that's no shock. Uh, topo maps can be confusing, especially if you've never worked with them. But even if you have worked with them, uh, it, it seems so helpful to be able to, to see a property, get a feel for it, and then look at a topo, and then it, it starts to click in your mind, and then every topo you look at starts to make more and more sense. Uh, what this one is, is telling us basically is that where the roads are, are the um, kind of the most level areas on the property, uh, which is why the roads were built there, the trails that turned into roads or whatnot were built there. Uh, from the roads, as you move away, it slopes down, um, at differing rates of, of steepness. Uh, basically on the topo map, when the lines are close, a property is steeper. When the lines are further apart, the property is more flat. So if we start here right at the center and we move, say, to the northeast, we've got this large area with no topo lines. That's telling us flat. It's saying, hey, that this is basically flat. Um, Although there, there could be a little up and down uh, on that. This is, is basically <laughs> letting us know that that's, a, that's very flat, if not perfectly flat. And then even when we do start to hit topo lines, they're spaced pretty far apart. Now, when you get to the extreme northeast part of the property, you see how those lines are getting closer and closer? That's starting to get steeper. But this, this entire northeast area here that we can see, um, that's going to be some nice usable property based on this topo map. Uh, this area here is interesting. That's still going to be usable, but there's actually the start of a small valley right there. And if you look at the map, we'll zoom out a bit. That valley that begins on your tract on 14 actually then flows down 8 and ultimately uh, out of there and, and down into a creek bed, I'm sure. Yep, right down there. 
so that's pretty cool to see. Uh, if you look um, southwest of the roads, let's start at about the same spot and we'll, we'll go um, west or southwest. Uh, it stays level for a bit and then it does start to slope. It slopes more than on the other side of the road, but I'm not sure I would call that steep without having first seen it yet. Um, the lines are, are closer than on the other side of the road, but they still have some decent spacing and um, they're at about the same interval. Uh, so they're, they're not changing, you know, the distance between them doesn't seem to be changing much. Uh, so that, that's telling us that um, it's going to have more slope to it, but it's certainly not going to be a, a bluff or something you can't walk up and down, I wouldn't think, uh, on that west side. So it's going to be very usable too. This again has the start of a, a little valley on it just like on your northern part, except on this one, the topo map goes so far as to tell us, hey, you know, there, there could be some uh, some water here. So it's got the, the blue line indicating um, water, creek bed or, or whatnot. Um, it's not necessarily telling us that there's a spring that comes out of the ground there. I, easy to think that looking at the map, because otherwise, how does the, the blue line, uh, you know, evolve <laughs> and come into being? But uh, more likely, they're just saying uh, the topo map is telling us, hey, this does have water in it sometimes um, enough that you're going to see signs that it's been a been a creek bed for quite, you know, quite a few hundred or thousand years. Uh, it's not necessarily saying that, hey, there's a spring that comes out of the ground. Now, that could be the case. Um, but if it were a, a major known spring, it would literally be labeled spring on this topo map. But really, of, of the dozens or hundreds of springs we've found, um, just a few, like half a dozen, have been shown on the topo map. Mostly they're, they're springs that, that we've discovered. And that would certainly, even without the blue line there, that, that's right where we would go and look if we were looking for a spring or possibly the start of a cave. Um, many of the, the caves we found, um, small or medium-sized caves, uh, or large. We haven't found many large caves, but I imagine the openings are similar. Uh, they've been around these areas that would also have a spring. But you got to remember that the caves often are formed by many, 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 many years of water flow in ground, underground. Uh, so when you've got a spring coming out of the ground, uh, basically you've got some type of cave back there. It might just be a, you know, something you could barely fit a salamander in, but there's some kind of cave because you've got water flow coming through there. Um, so yeah, the, the same conditions that would allow a spring to come out of the ground are, are the same conditions that um, make it possible for a cave to exist. Plus this area of, of the Ozarks of Arkansas is known for, uh, for pretty impressive caves, and there's a huge one, I believe, less than a two or three miles to the north of here. Uh, I can't I'm spacing on the, the name right now, but uh, yeah, there, there is uh, more than one uh, major cave uh, in this area. Um, looking at this, this very southern little chunk here, uh, that for the most part looks level. As you get to the very south part and it, it starts to kind of, you start to cross over onto the neighboring tract, it, it looks like it slopes down there. But by and large, this, this southern little triangle here looks pretty darn level. Oops. So looking at this, just because a lot of times people do ask us, um, you know, if you guys were going to go do a site, where would you do it? Kind of, you know, getting some information for themselves as to where they should start looking. And if someone were to ask us that on this tract, um, for, for us, easy answer. Uh, we would probably do some kind of driveway. All right, start in the center here. We'd do some kind of driveway leading off the easement road obviously get beyond the setback distance, whatever that is, look at the listing page, it'll, it'll show you that. Um, but get back as far as you want to so that you feel, so that you get the feeling you're looking for. I mean, if you want to be a couple hundred feet off the road, that's great. Then you're going to have some privacy that will put you back in here somewhere. Uh, and then start kind of looking at, uh, hey, you know, where do I want my site? Um, looking at this topo map, you're probably going to find some areas right in here that are perfectly level. So that's it. That's nice to have on a site. Um, I've seen some some hillside sites that have been fantastic, but I don't think there's ever been a building site that's been hurt by having some sort of level ground. 
So that's something that, that we look for. Um, on the plus side, if you have access to any kind of machinery, uh, you can create level ground just about anywhere. And that's something the guys have done hundreds of times, even with just a, a small um, bobcat or a, a tractor with a back blade. Um, as long as you're not talking about a, a steep, rocky hillside, uh, you can create enough level ground to, to do a build site or a parking area um, in just a matter of a few hours, uh, depending on, on what kind of equipment you're using. Uh, but yeah, we would start here. Uh, we would do some kind of driveway. We would probably put it at a bit of an angle to ensure that when the site was built, you, you couldn't look straight down the driveway and necessarily see um, any road traffic. Not that there would be much, but uh, so yeah, we'd, we'd go back a couple hundred feet and we'd open up a site and we'd uh, kind of pick and choose. Depending on how the, how the ground was, you, you might have the chance to have some nice views, so you'd want to have a look at that. Um, but th that's where we would do it. I mean, just looking at this topo map, you've got a large area here. Um, you know, a couple acres in size that looks like it would be level enough to, to be usable as a site. Uh, and we like to have a little up and down in our sites. We like to have some flat area. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, but honestly, to us, a site that's entirely flat, eh, <laughs> it's kind of lackluster. So it's cool to have, um, you know, a flat area to park, a flat area, depending on what kind of structure you want to build. Um, but, you know, we, we like a little slope to it, too. So uh, the northeast part of this track 14, mm, that'd be a fun place to, to do a driveway uh, and a site. Um, by the way, we can we can generally get you written permission to uh, remove timber for a driveway and a site uh, fairly easily. I mean, you can contact us for details, but we've got a, um, a pretty good little program in place that's that's worked well for everybody for years. Um, otherwise, once the property has been paid for in full, you can do what you please with the timber on your property. But uh, until then, you can't cut timber with a, a stump diameter greater than eight inches. And that's when measured at ground level. So if you're a uh, a logger and you're used to measuring at breast height, that's probably about a four inch breast height, but uh, it's it's eight inches at ground level. Nothing uh, larger than that can be cut, removed, disturbed until the property's been paid for in full, unless you get written permission from us. But we'll work with you on that. Get a hold of us for details. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, track 14, super, super cool property. Love the location. Uh, love seeing this northeast part. And uh, actually that would be fun to to explore in person um, just because it's it's neat to see something that has the, the kind of topography that we really like to do a, a site and a driveway and I think the northeast part of 14 has that I also like the fact that over here on the west side you've got a chance of of maybe having a spring maybe having some kind of small cave uh, that's something that we'd look at as well uh, and if there did happen to be a spring or a small cave that could change where we would want to do a building site you know if this were a property that we were doing that on um, it, it might be cool to, uh, let's say for instance, there's some, you unearth a really cool spring or a really cool cave, uh, over here. Um, there's always ways to get in a driveway and a parking area or a site or whatnot. Uh, even if you've got some, some hillside and wouldn't that be cool to have a, a little cabin set up right next to a live spring or, or the mouth of a cave. So, um, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, that's. Uh, a lot of fun stuff with this one. So that track 14, we tried to keep the video short. We went over 20 minutes. We could keep talking about this property. There's a lot that, that we haven't even said yet that we would love to tell you about, but um, you might as well read through the listing page, check out the videos. And then if you have any questions, uh, you can give us a call in the office Monday through Friday, or you can hit us up by email anytime. Uh, and we'll, we'll uh, answer any questions you may have, or we'll chat about the property if it's available. Uh, if it's not, then um, we'll let you know what, what we have and what's coming up. And uh, basically, we just love to talk about properties in the Ozarks. So get a hold of us. <laughs> we'll talk all day. If you have any questions, let us know.